Welcome to another episode of Spotlight. On today's episode, we have Claire Cahill talking to us about a 29 year career in corporate world and the transformation that she worked to go self-employed and provide mentoring services back into the environment which she'd come from. Right, so first of all, just a brief intro to who you are and um, your business. And how, yeah, who you are and your business. Okay, so my name is Claire Cahill and I'm an executive confidence and leadership coach. My business is Ascendo Coaching and Training, and Ascendo is the Latin for Ignite. And that's what I'd like to think I do with my clients is ignite their potential to be the best self. And you've not always done that, have you? You came from a corporate background before, so you swapped. So when did you make that change? So I made that change two years ago. Well, I say two years ago. I started my career back in 1990 when I left school, and I was one of the few that knew exactly what she wanted to do when she left school. <laughs> yeah. So I went to work for a financial organisation, and I stayed there for 29 years. I set up my business um, whilst I was still employed. So I was employed, I'm self-employed, and then it was two years ago that I made that final leap of faith to just pure self-employment. Awesome. 29 years in a corporate job. Yeah. How did you survive that long? It was yeah. tough. Yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah. Um, that must be so varied as well. Yeah. Like it was. where you've gone to today. Yeah. Yeah. So I started my um, time off in the retail part of the building society. So doing face to face. I set my goal that I wanted to be a branch manager, and I achieved that goal by the time I was twenty four. So even though I started at fifteen, because I was a July baby. Um, yeah, I'd achieved that goal by the time I was 24. So I spent half of my career in the branch network and I spent half of my career in contact centre world. And contact centre world was very different. So um, listening to people on the phone, so that I had to connect to my listening skills more um, and leading a team in a contact centre where you could just listen to, into people's conversations at any time. So it was a little bit like living in the big brother house mm. that you could just drop in and, you know, nobody was safe really because, you know, whatever was recorded was the reality of, of the situation. Um, but I had different leadership roles in contact centre world. So I had my own team and then I had a team of team managers when I went into a senior leadership role. So I typically stay in roles for about five years before moving on to a, a bigger team or a different environment. Just to touch on that, so you did, I mean, 29 years is an insane amount of time to do. Was that all at the same place? Yes, it was all for Nationwide Building Society. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. um, and yeah, some might say it's loyalty, yeah. others might say it's insanity yeah. and you're institutionalised. Yeah. And I think what I've learned since coming out of corporate world is, is it doesn't matter who you work for. As soon as you start working with people, the challenges are the same. Yeah. So whether you're in public sector, private sector, um, yeah. education, whether you're a small to medium enterprise, as soon as you have employees, the challenges are exactly the same. Is this a cult that we're in? <laughs> Like, do we belong to a cult? Like, is this real? Like, and it is real, isn't it? It's just, it's their way of like making a family and making a secure environment. But that's what makes it difficult to leave because as a human, you think that you're going to miss that or you won't be able to thrive or especially if you're doing well in that environment without being in that security of it. And that's not necessarily true because exactly what you've said, it's like you're just deploying the skills to work with other people, aren't you? Yeah. As as you go, but that's definitely a fear that lots of people, not necessarily young younger people like these, but when you've been stuck in a job or like stuck in a career, you, you that stepping away from that blanket that it provides you, whether it's teeth, pension. I mean, I even had physio. I mean, they used to go to the physio ten times a year and have a massage. It's like, and then you just bring this number up and they say, yeah, fine, bosh. <laughs> Someone send you a check. It's like. Crazy. Ten once a month, I'd go from that. Hard to walk away from, though, isn't it? But it's all. It is that your own perception of that. I think it comes from your values as well. So your values are instilled in you from your childhood, from your family, from your influences. So I was always told that it's safe, it's secure, it provides a regular good income, 
why would you want to walk away from that environment? And a lot of people said, you know, if they cut you in half, yes, you would bleed pride because that was nationwide yeah, yeah, analogy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and, I, and, you know, I still take that pride with me now and, and that is part of, of who I am. But what I realised when I left corporate world was I was just a cog in a wheel mm. and that wheel still functions without me and people who you thought will were your allies, were your friends, don't hear a dicky word from them. Of course not, yeah. But yeah, when you were in that environment, you would ring them, you would check in with them, you would make sure that they're okay. Um, you know, if they were having a bad day, you'd, you'd pick them up and you'd lift them. But yeah, as soon as you leave, there's just a handful of people that I now regularly stay in contact with. Um, and I've seen that as lots of people have left corporate world it is still only a small group yeah. of people that, that stay in contact. And so you start to question, so why did I stay for as long as what I did? And I and I, and I think this next generation, that, that loyalty isn't the same. Um, and that's, I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad no. thing. Um, Joy's out on that at the minute, I would have thought. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, I regularly have conversations with people about why do you do what you do and why do you stay in a place that you're so unhappy in or that isn't giving you that fulfilment. In my mind that this is what I'm going to have to do for the next 40 years, I can't live with that. Like, and my mum, she didn't realise but it was actually my mum's fault because my mum had a really good job and she worked, uh, you know, she went from working in John Lewis doing ironing demos to selling to John Lewis and Harrods and Fordham and Masons and she had all these massive accounts with a company called Group 7. She was the national account manager. So from like ironing in John Lewis to being, it was a pretty meteoric rise. And I remember the day that she retired and literally two days later she had to take employment because she said to me, I've just instantly become a nobody. And I was like, what do you mean? She went, well, last week I was ringing the buy-in manager at Harrods to say goodbye after dealing with them for 20 years and they're never going to ring me again. I'm never going to stand up in a board meeting in a room and present. I was like, oh, geez, I don't want to... And I instantly thought, I don't want that. That's not what I want for myself. And it was really... this. I actually threw that back at her when they were shouting at me about it. But it was just like, yeah, it's that. And he, my mum did it for way too long than she would, but like way longer than you, you know what I mean? Like her entire, like, I remember she, they've only got money because she bought shares when the public, where company went public. And my dad had one to them for 30 years before they cashed them in. And she bought them at like 20 pence or whatever. They were now worth like 25 pound a share. They don't know anything about shares, mum and dad, yeah. but old school, but it can provide you that blanket. So it is difficult to walk, walk away from it. And I think it's about, I think it's for other people to, not necessarily think it's that hard to do. I think it's about those influences because my mum stayed in her career for 30 years as a civil servant um, and I saw her go through pits of depression um, and when I wrote one of my chapters in my book she actually said to me that's the most virile thing you could have ever written Claire and I said well, one, I'm not quite sure what virile means, so I'll just have to Google it. Yeah. Um, but I don't understand what, what what you mean. And she said, well, this is how you've portrayed me. And I said, well, this is my version of my truth growing up and seeing my mum having to crush tablets because she couldn't swallow them to get a good night's sleep and being not being able to function and get off of the settee and actually, because she was really, really unhappy. And she actually said to me, well, I believe you do what you do in spite of me. And I said, no, I said, I do what I do because of you. Yeah. Because I'm making a choice that no, I'm not saying that that medicine can't cure you, but I'm choosing not to take any kind of drug to make me happy. I'm gonna train my brain to make the choices that I want to, cho to choose and I'm going to educate people in my coaching business that this is this is the 
choices that they have and they're all empowered to make those choices themselves and there's no right or wrong decision but we live by the decisions that we make and I said I absolutely love you to the end of this world but I don't want to necessarily be like you. Yeah. You stayed in a career for as long as what you did, you got your early retirement, she's 74 now and she still works at the post office. And I said, that just blows my mind. I don't understand why you don't want to retire. And it's for that very reason that your mum had said is she feels like she has to have a purpose in the world. And that's absolutely fine. And I've learned to accept that. And I even joke now with her and say, I'm sure I'll get a phone call from the postmaster one day to say that's where I need to collect your money Body from. from. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> because, you know, and, and she, she's always been a career woman. Yeah. And what she's taught me is is that you can have a career and you can be a mum and you can do both. And yes, there were sacrifices that she made, but I had a fabulous relationship with my nana. And when my nana died, I felt like my mum had died. Yeah. So when I wrote about both of them in my book, um, you know, yes, I can see how I portrayed my mum in one light and my nana in another light, but they were the two big influences in my life. And I am who I am today because of a makeup of both of them. But I just didn't want to follow in my mum's footsteps. And I said, I did 29 years, you did 30. I got out a year before you. You did 60 years but, in, yeah, between you. Yeah. You know, we stayed because we believed that that was right because we had a loyalty to the, the organisation. It was bringing in that regular income. And now she has actually said to me, I get what you do, Claire, and I understand what you do. And maybe you ought to have a word with your dad about mindfulness. <laughs> and I went, that is not a challenge I ever want to take on because he's never, ever going to change. He is who he is and he'll never, ever understand what I do. And that's absolutely fine. But he's happy. My mum and my dad... Lockdowns were a challenge for them both. Uh, that's been shielded as well. And my mum's had anxiety problems. Especially in the last 10 years, she's really had anxiety problems. Um, around retiring and all of that, it's all sort of all came up on go. And um, they've really struggled with lockdown. And I would say this side of Christmas, they've both been the happiest I've ever seen them. Right? My mum's the least anxious that she's ever been because she's found doing jigsaw puzzles helps. And I was like, Mum, I've been encouraging you to do something like that for years. Because I've said to you, it's training of the brain. It's like, whilst you're doing that, you are not anxious. And if you... She's jigsawing for like eight hours a day and she's the happiest I've ever seen her, right? And she's flying through these jigsaws. It's boring, it's jigsaw, it's not for everyone, but, but it's working for my mum. And my dad, he's 70, <laughs> I mean, he couldn't boil a potato four months ago. He's telling me how to make cock of hands and all sorts. I'm smiling at that because it was my dad's birthday last Friday and um, me and my youngest son had taken him afternoon tea and I'd said to Henry, look, I can't leave afternoon tea on the doorstep, so we'll put our masks on and we'll give granddad his, his tea, he's had his first vaccine, but he's not through it yet. And we walked in, no sign of granddad. And he was at the dining room table doing jigsaw. Jigsaw, and yeah. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm doing jigsaw. And I went, well, oh, that's the first. I've never quite seen that. And then we just had a quick conversation about what he had for his birthday. And my sister had sent him a jigsaw. And then he said, well, open this one, Claire. And he was really excited about it. There was nothing on the front of the box. And I opened the box and there was a picture of his dog, which my sister had had done into Real. a jigsaw. And I said, well, I can't wait to see that. As a, yeah. I can't wait to see Ruby as a jigsaw. So yeah, it is. It's really, really funny. And, and then I thought back to the conversation that my mum had had with me about mindfulness. And I thought, I don't need to teach him mindfulness because he's doing a jigsaw. He's got it. He's got it. Uh, it may be you just don't see that because you're choosing to work at the post office, which is fine. So you've got your sanctuary and he's actually got his sanctuary in the bungalow. And yeah, happy. You had a confidence crisis. Was this when you was in corporate job? Yes, yeah, so this was after the birth of my second son. Second son, yeah. So he was born October 2010. And I took six months off work and returned to work because financially I needed to, but emotionally I wasn't ready. And 
before I went on maternity leave, I'd got a new boss. So I'd not had a chance to build a relationship with her. And in the six months that I was off, all of the other team leaders had had an opportunity to build a relationship. I'd gone in and I'd done a couple of keep in touch days. But they hadn't gone great. Um, so I returned back to work and I stayed in work for 10 weeks and every day I'd put my makeup on, I'd get dressed, so I'd fake it till I made it. Yeah. Nobody would know what was going on inside. Um, and one day I just went in an office with my boss and just said, I can't do this anymore. I cannot continue with how I'm feeling. So I got my bag and coat and went off sick for 12 weeks, something that I'd never done in all of my career. Um, and yeah, I just left with her voice ringing through, I can deal with you now, you're broken. And I was like, great, just what I need. That's a whole different story. Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's, so that's, so I had my confidence crisis and I think it was a, a case of, I knew my family was now complete. Um, and who was I? So I was a mother. I was a wife, I was a daughter, a sister, a leader, but who was Claire Cahill? I'd just lost her along the way. So in the time that I was off sick, I just spent um, time just journaling. So whatever thoughts came into my head went into my book. Um, and I tried to understand what, how are my thoughts affecting how I feel and how is that impacting my behaviour and why is it that that, impact my confidence and so by writing everything down i was able to start to see patterns in my thinking patterns in my behavior and who my behavior changed with and it helped me start to think about right what is it that i need to sort out first but ultimately it was me it was who am i and what do i bring to this world and to the people that I'm around um, and in corporate world you have to jump through all the hoops so I had to go to the doctors the doctor said it's not postnatal depression because you wouldn't be able to come into my surgery with your children if it was postnatal depression I went to see uh, I had on phone counseling um, and the counselor was saying you can clearly articulate what you're thinking what you're feeling why are you behaving how you're behaving so it's not counseling that you need so i then went to see a cognitive behavior therapist the cognitive behavior therapist said exactly the same no it's it, you don't need therapy okay then so if i don't need counseling I don't need therapy i don't need to be off sick what is it that i actually need because i, I clearly am still not a hundred percent and every single person that i saw even when I went to occupational health with work, they all said, this is work-related stress. It's a management issue. It's a relationship issue. It's nothing else. And that was then when I thought, okay then, so if it's about the here and now, what is it that I need to help me move forward? And that's then when I came across coaching. So I always knew that I loved coaching. As, as a leader, but that's when I came across the coaching academy and thought, okay then, let's go and see what all this coaching is about and let's see if it does do what it says on the tin and it can transform me. So off I went down to London, didn't have the confidence to go to London on my own, so brought my husband along with me and he just said, in the space of 24 hours, I've got my wife back, yeah, your nice. eyes are sparkling, um, you know, you're smiling through your eyes again and I didn't need him the second day, but I used that second day to actually be coached on how am I going to return to work and how am I going to deal with the boss that I have no relationship with. Um, and that's how I started my coaching journey um, and got over my confidence crisis. Have you got any advice for dealing with negative feedback? I always look at feedback, it's, it's a gift. So you can choose to open that gift or you can leave it unwrapped. And you're absolutely right, it's somebody's opinion. Um, and that opinion is valid at that moment in time. Um, and yeah, so my advice would just be, it's a lesson. And so what is that lesson that you're learning? And what are the good things that you need to take from that 
and what are maybe the bad things that you need to take away and do something different about. Um, so I always say that all feedback, whether it's positive or negative, is a gift and it's a lesson and it's what are you going to learn from that and what are you going to take to be bigger and better. Um, and, and I talk about Google reviews, so even if you get a negative Google review, you should always respond yeah. and say, well, tell me more about it. Seek to understand where that person's coming from. Um, and I think, you know, we're very good, aren't we, at, give it, at complaining about something rather than actually saying, oh, this is really good. And I find that I do more of the, this is really good, and I get really uncomfortable if I have to complain about something. Yeah, same. Yeah, <laughs> um, same. But because, because, yes, I have been on, on the receiving end of it. One of the exercises that I encourage my clients to do is the shadow I cast. So I'll say, I want you to go out to all of your nearest and dearest, the, the ones that will tell you truthfully and honestly, and ask them the question, what is it like to be around me when I'm at my best? And what is it like to be around me when I'm at my worst? And they will give it to me. Yeah. So I asked my family that, and my husband said, Claire, when you're at your best, you're the heartbeat of the family. And I thought, wow, nobody's ever said that to me before. And that's really, really fabulous. So I went, okay, I'm ready for it. Or what is it like to be around me when I'm at my worst? He went, Claire, he said, you're like a dominant, demanding red dragon in a whirlwind. <laughs> What I've taken from being a dominant, demanding red dragon in a whirlwind is, okay, well, I could have taken that as negative feedback. However, that is the truth. So how can I use that to my advantage? So if we're in the middle of a crisis, you're going to need a dominant, demanding yeah, red dragon, dragon yeah. in a whirlwind that says JFDI. This is what needs to happen by this time, just do it. And only come to me with a solution, not a further problem. So I now sort of laugh and joke with my family. If they stop listening to me, I'll say you've got five seconds and then the dragon is being unleashed because my buttons are now being pressed. Uh. <laughs> so you have a choice. Uh. Do you want the fun loving, inspiring woman that's in front of you or do you want the dragon? <laughs> because my buttons are being pressed, that you have to understand yourself before you can start to understand others. Yeah. So I spend quite a lot of time helping leaders raise that self-awareness about you know, what is it that you do day to day? How can you play to those strengths? How do those strengths help the team? Um, and what are your potential blind spots and development areas um, and how might that hinder the team and, and therefore what might you need to work on and change and unless you understand yourself inside out you're never ever then going to be able to understand others because how can you tap into others potential yeah, you can't. if you don't know the potential yeah, you yourself can't. so when I work with leaders I always say right you need to now start and stand and look in the mirror and what's what's reflecting back let's look at all of the good stuff yeah do you like that it? is being reflected yeah, yeah, back yeah. and and let's you know enable that person to show up in business every day because that's who you are at your best but also acknowledging that you know even when we're happy we can't be positive all of the time and you know there will be times when we, we have our down days and we're not feeling Listen, that's it, natural and that's nature, natural yeah. and, and that's and that's right and we should embrace that but it's about then being able to articulate Do you know what i'm not firing off all cylinders today i'm not my best self i'm not the best leader that i can be today because this is what's going on for me um and so actually if i'm not interacting with you in the the way that i would normally interact with you it's because this is what's going on for me and i need to address this so that i can come back later to get the best out of you so advice I'd give to leaders is, yeah, get to know yourself inside out and, you know, look at who inspires you as a leader and what's all the qualities that they've got. And are they qualities that you've got or you can actually get? You know, what are the skills that you need to, to learn um, to be a great leader? 
Um, and you know, I, I'll always encourage people to you know look at any sort of TV programs, the news. You know, who are the great leaders out there? Who are the really horrific leaders, and, and why is that? And we'll all have a different opinion on who's a great leader and and who's not. You know, listen to podcasts, watch um, TED talks, watch YouTube videos, and start to then think about well, what is it that I like about those leaders? And how can I then develop those leadership traits in myself? Um, and I suppose that comes back down to then journaling, doesn't it? What yeah. are all the positives about me? What are all the negatives? What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? And then what opportunities and potential threats have I got? I'd also um, advise future leaders to get a mentor or to get a coach so that they've got that safe space for them to talk about their own vulnerabilities. And I don't think there's anything wrong in being a vulnerable leader. Um, you know, when I, when I think back on my leadership career, you know, at times I went on training events and I get quite emotional because I'm a really passionate and enthusiastic individual. You know, I have, I, I love to be liked, as we all do, but as I've developed, I'd rather be, I'd love to be liked and respected. But if I had to have a choice of respect or like, I'd take respect. And actually there'll be some decisions that I make as a leader that you won't like. So therefore, as long as you respect the decisions that I make, you might dislike me as a person and I'm okay with that, but I've had to learn that. So, and that's come from a lot of feedback that I've had on, of Clay, you know, your emotions are your most powerful, but also your most destructive. And I used to get told off quite a lot about expressing that emotion and tears are a release of how you're feeling. And, you know, there were times when, yeah, I would burst into tears in a training environment and they'd say, that's got to stop. And then actually you learn to suppress your emotion. And that then became part of my problem when I had my confidence crisis, because, well, actually to be strong, you don't cry. And actually, that's your vulnerability. And actually crying is a strength. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, you might have to pick your right environment. Um, so, yeah, my advice to future leaders is embrace whatever your vulnerability is. And again, it comes back to the feedback. Take the feedback and own the feedback. And ultimately, the only opinion that truly matters is the one that you hold about yourself. So make sure it's a good one. True. It's so <laughs> true. It's so true. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. Yeah. Literally, as long as you're happy with yourself, it doesn't matter. I think one of the I think one of the things that I struggled with around leadership at the start when I employed Jules was I've actually got to lead them. <laughs> this means I've probably got to take this a bit more seriously. So coaching and mentoring it becomes really important because if you've not done it before, you, you do need guidance and like especially when you're dealing with like ne feedback, negative, positive on yourself. Like actually having that sort of person to talk to it shows that you're taking it seriously and you're not just thinking, oh, it's something that I'll move on to. And I think when you, if you're a, like an early starter in your 20s, like you sound like you were pretty successful by the time you were 24. I um, read the Duncan Banner Times excerpt about him buying his ice cream van at 28. And I was like, I am leaving my job. I'm not buying an ice cream van, but I'm going to do, I'm going to do something with my life that's not filling the corporate computer system it was just the same. It doesn't matter. It was just the same. Like, I talk just... about those ten-year cycles. Yeah. What I wanted and needed in my twenties was very different as I was going into my thirties, and very different as I went into my forties, and now forty-seven next. Yeah. As I head towards fifties, I'm sure that'll all change again. Um, and I was talking to my husband about his annual review last week, and he's fifty in November. And I said, okay, I said, so one of the questions on your annual review is, what is your ambitions? I said, and the ambitions that you've put on here, I went, they're not ambitions. I said, I want you to really start to think about it. If you've got 15 years left of yeah. your career, yeah, 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 which, which takes you to 65, 65, what is it in your heart of hearts that you truly want to do? Because if I was the CEO doing your annual review, and that's what's going to happen, that's the conversation 
that I want to have. I want to know what's going to make you get out of bed in the morning and see. What's, you know, what, what are the things that you want to do in the next 15 years? And how can I then help you as the leader achieve your ambitions? This is your opportunity to dream big. It doesn't mean to say that you're going to achieve everything that you put on that page, but the, the corporate organisation is giving you an opportunity to say, these are my ambitions. And it's not about just coming and doing this job for the next 15 years. No. And that's, but that's what a lot of people will think. And I said, and as you go in to do your annual reviews with your team, you're going to be asking them that same question around what are their ambitions. And as a leader, you need to challenge their ambitions because are they big enough? Because, you know, and, and some people will just want to get out of bed in the morning, come and do this job for the you know, rest of the life. But I would say if they're 60 and they're looking at their retirement, yeah. then again, I'd be having another conversation with them. So what are your ambitions for your retirement? Tired, what, what are, are the things do, yeah. that you want to do uh, in your retirement? Uh, but actually, you start having those conversations at 50 because you've got 15 years to plan what you want to do uh, in your retirement. That We work hard on that here, like, especially when we're progressing people through roles. So Danielle's just had a a step up in the last couple of months and we we've got to the point where we we actually didn't have a defined role for her so it was like i've had to go back to the drawing board and be like right what is danielle's actual job like so that that's then danielle's job and then gabs and soph can aspire to that level and then danielle can and then we've got a chain of aspiration then so you're like yeah it's sort of i'm having to think about these guys for the next 10 15 years as well so it's just it, it, what I'm trying to say is it filters through your whole life. If you can crack it in one area, you can apply that teaching, can't you, to every aspect of your life. And mm. that's a really good way of improving your overall life. That is the answer to the question around what advice would you give to future leaders? It's about having that aspiration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then working out a plan yeah. as to how to achieve it. you're going to achieve yeah. it. Yeah. And I watched... Uh, I either watched or read something from a guy called Stephen Bartlett recently that was like, the plan is 10 years long. So there's now and 10 years to get to your plan. So really what happens this week doesn't really matter because it's just one week in a 10 year plan. You're like, well, he's right because that's actually 520 weeks. This week being shit doesn't really matter if there's 519 other great weeks never going to be like that. But that really helped me like take that lesson and think, how do I apply what I'm doing at work into other aspects of my life? And actually, I, I didn't suffer with anxiety or anything like that, but it really, it's really helped me feel loads more at ease. I was like, I've got a plan. Yeah, I've got it's a plan. about having that plan, reviewing that plan, changing that plan. Yeah. And, and that, I know that was one of the things that I sort of said to my husband, don't ask me what the plan is because it'll be changed yeah. by next week. Bobby. Because who knows what's going to happen. But all I know is, is that I need to make that leap of faith. And when I make that leap of faith, it's not about I don't want to work. It's not about I don't want to earn money. I want to earn money and I'm going to go on a journey and there'll be things that go really well. There'll be things that don't go so well, but it's about I need to recognise when it's not going well and stop yeah. and think about it and change yeah. and, and do it. And I, I remember putting a LinkedIn post on, it must have been August 2020 and it was the change curve um, and I just said actually I'm in the depression pit and loads of people got in touch with me and said Claire why are you there and I went oh no I said I'm out of it now I said but the purpose of my post was we all go through change at different times of our life some of it will be big change some of it will be small change and actually I'm six months into leaving corporate world and the reason why I'm in that depression pit is because there'll be a sense of grief, of loss, um, all of the excitement of suddenly I'm self-employed and I'm doing it has gone, gone. Yeah. and reality has hit and I'm sat here thinking, shit, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? What, what am I charging? Why am I charging what I'm charging? I could be probably stacking shelves in a supermarket and having the same amount of income coming in 
shit, what am I doing? But that was all part of the process, all part of the journey. And the tears came and the conversations came. But it was about knowing who am I going to reach out to? Who are my trusted advisors, confidants that I can be my vulnerable self to? Um, and actually, then I am going to be visible and I'm going to share that with the world yeah. on social media because it's not always plain sailing. And sometimes what we see on social media is we will see all of the positive stuff or we'll see all of the negative stuff and we'll filter what we want to, to, to see. But actually, I just want to share that I'm human and I've gone through that depression pit and I'm coming out the other side now and the plan's changed. And actually, I'm very, very clear now on who my ideal clients are, who my target market are, where I need to position myself, what I charge, I value my worth, and again, it was that whole personal journey that I was going on. And it's not just about taking any business just for the sake of the money coming in. And I had to trust the process and trust that actually, if I have no clients for the next six months, that's okay. okay. Yeah. Because what I'm doing is I'm putting my foundations in place. But the reality is, is what happened was suddenly I had paying clients every single month and they were paying me my worth. And it was almost that message that I had to say to myself and the rest of the world of, right, no more messing about now. This is who I am, what I do, why I do it, why I charge what I charge, and the transformation that people have with working with me. And therefore, this is now what I'm doing and I'm trusting the plan and the process. Oh, so how have you adapted during COVID? So I had to adapt very, very quickly. So predominantly having a face-to-face -face business and seeing um, my coaching clients in coffee shops, in hotel bars, um, that could, couldn't happen. Um, I've got training events that I had to cancel um, and do refunds of. Um, so I thought very quickly, if I don't move online, I'm not going to have a coaching and training business. So that's how I adapted. So I now, um, Zoom became my new best friend um, and I could still coach my clients oh, yeah. face to face, oh, yeah. albeit through a laptop screen. And that worked really, really well. There was just um, one occasion where my coaching client needed to talk about the person who was in the house with them. And so again, it was just about, this is about creating that safe psychological space for you to share what you needed to share. But there's a chat function on it. So we just yeah, chatted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it was, it, for me, it, it was a case of, why have I not done this yeah, before? Yeah, yeah. Why have I not taken my coaching business yeah, online? Right. And even with training, I moved my training online um, and I just made sure that I had, rather than, groups of 12 and 20 in a room. I just had six in a room because on Zoom, I could then see them all on a screen. I could still read their body language. I could still see that they were interacting, um, but I could also still put them in breakout rooms. So I could either put them in pairs or I could put them in threes in breakout rooms to discuss whatever we were discussing and come back. So yeah, moving forward, my business will now be a mix of face to face and online um, and I think you know what I've realized is, is actually I can get up in the morning go into my study start work at a time that I choose not having to think about right is the petrol in the car yeah. what's my journey at what time am I gonna have to, to leave home um, and, I, and I've been able to see more people in the same amount of time as what I would have done if I was traveling definitely yeah. about balance I, well, what I'm talking to my customers about now is that, uh, especially the bigger ones, is preparing the transition to some normality and keeping the good stuff that we've got going on digitally and online and how that migrates into real face-to-face -face meetings with people. It's like now, you, I would never go, to, I would never drive to affect, I would never get in the car or the, on the train and go to a meeting in London without having Zoomed a person before. Mm -hmm. 
I would have never would have, like I literally won't ever do that ever again. Like, yeah. what's the point? Yeah. Like, I've got no idea if I'm actually going to like them. Yeah. Like, I could spend twenty minutes with them on Zoom and save myself the journey, or fact find or anything to be better prepared. So yeah, Zoom is probably going to for us. It'll probably be it'll probably go Zoom Zoom meeting or Zoom Zoom no meeting until we've agreed. And the first meeting will be like a constructive. Like we've got one next week. We've never met the guy ever. We've agreed this massive project with him and he's going to come in here and do a brainstorm. So that our first proper meeting with them will be a socially distanced brainstorm. That's, that's a great first meeting as opposed to what do you do? How do you do it? We've cut all that bullshit out. Neither of us spent a penny going to meet each other. So yeah, there's so many elements of it to keep. It's just, I think, getting the right balance for yourself moving... So you might look at doing something like, um, I don't know if you have monthly meetings with your customers, but you might move to a monthly, monthly, quarterly face-to-face, which will work yeah. just as well as face-to-face, 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 and it'll work better than Zoom, 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 yeah. won't it? It'll be like, but that will work, and from your profit, that's a way better model than driving to see them every month. Yeah. So, yeah. It's even like, we've, I mean, the biggest shift, I think, was around training, and I've never particularly enjoyed e-learning yeah um so again when i was in corporate world and you had to do all the oh, mandatory yeah. training and it was a case of oh, God, i'd rather scoop my eyes out with a blunt object than sit here and look at this screen yeah. and interact however even though i've taken my training online people will get a workbook there'll be pre-work that they need to do but it's very interactive so it's not about read this watch this complete this workbook it's about we're talking to people on on the the workshop on the training albeit on zoom and then you'll have some post course work that you'll do and it's about how are you going to apply that learning back in the workplace and when i next see you at the at the second session we're going to talk about how you've applied that learning so there'll be some of my training that will now only ever be delivered online There'll be others that it's absolutely right for it to be face to face, and especially, um, you know, if, if it's a team and you need all of the team together, you can still socially distance them. But you're absolutely right. There might be some stuff that we do online first, and then we actually meet face to face because we really want to try and test the models, the coaching models, yeah. how you've applied it in practice. Let's bring it to life, and that then is easier if you're in a room with a flip chart. Um, because what I typically do is listen to what delegates are saying and start to draw on flip chart, draw out the models that, that they've been using or highlight, actually, if you use these models, you might then get a different result with your team and to be able to flip the flip chart over and be in that face-to-face environment um, is, is worthwhile. That's not to say that it can't be done online. No good for the soul yeah just having the balance yeah it's all about balance i think that the the balance was probably completely skewed the wrong way before we just nobody really realized it it will be interesting to see what happens in corporate world because again i think it is about a balance so i remember in corporate world saying actually we've got a flexible working policy but do we really have a flexible working policy so i was very fortunate that i worked four days a week i did a full-time job in four days a week i then asked can i now work three days a week because my business is really taking off no why because if we do it for you we're going to have to do it for everybody else but no this is about this is right for me it might not be right for everybody else but if it is right for everybody else so what? I think that the... Why don't we do it? Whereas now we've been forced into a position where everybody's had to work from yeah. home. Everybody now has mitigation yeah. to say, actually, I can do, that from home. I can do this from home. Yeah. So, and it'll be interesting to see how many flexible working requests go into HR, how companies respond to it. And, you know, and that's where I come in as a coach of, right, well, actually, I can help you think through strategically mm. how are you going to do this and actually if you've got happier staff they're going to be more productive yeah they are it's going to be a challenge for and i think that i think that the corporate world as we know it is going to be well we've got two corporate worlds don't we let's face it in this country we've got corporate london and then we've got the rest of the uk because obviously corporate london the world centers around anyone that lives in london i'm going to move to london live in a flat the size of that city you do that uh, 
It's all changed. Because mm -hmm. they're all in, out they're all living in shoeboxes that aren't worth anything now. Yeah, I'm coaching some apprentices, some senior leaders and some financial services, and all live in and around London, and they've all said, gosh, the amount of time that I've got back from not commuting. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. Um, and actually, I, I quite enjoy now yeah. working from home. Yeah. Um, there was others who said, actually, I miss that social interaction, I miss that coffee break conversations, and you know, some of them have been allowed into the office, um, but only on certain days, yeah. but yeah. Is what's next for you? What What's the plan for the business uh, moving forward? Okay, so I've currently got my um, training programmes going through CPD accreditation. So that'll mean that I'll be able to offer anybody that comes on to my workshops CPD certificates. So if they're in the um, profession and they need to have regular CPD, I'll be able to um, offer that. I'll also be doing online coaching still. Um, and like we said, depending upon what happens when we come out of this pandemic, I'd like to think that I can have a balance in my business. So I'll see people face to face and online. Um, but yeah, the plan is just to continue keep going. to grow. Yeah, keep yeah going. and I'd love to double my income on last year. Funnily enough, um, 2020 was the best year financially <laughs> for me, and 2021 has started off really well. So long may that yeah, continue. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, I, and I do think that you know the, the world is changing. People are realizing that actually investing in their personal development is the good investment to make. Um, and yeah, I just think that people are thinking wisely about how do I invest money and what do I get on a return on investment. And that's always the challenge for um, coaches. The return on investment <laughs> or the investment that you make, you don't go into a shop and buy a new you, no, you don't. and come out of the shop. So it's about you're investing in your own personal growth, your transformation. And I always say the return on investment is totally dependent on the action that you take. I'm just that catalyst for change. And I'll ask the questions that nobody else will ask you um, because I'll be naturally curious about who you are, who your team are, um, and the benefit of getting an outsider in is, is that they don't know your business, so they can ask all the questions to understand your business. Whereas when you use internal coaches, internal trainers, they make those assumptions. Um, so, yeah, so I just want to continue being that third party that goes in, supports individuals and comes back out and goes back in again yeah. when they need that help and support to move forward. Awesome. Awesome. So that concludes another episode of Spotlight with Claire Cahill. Uh, some really interesting insights into examining your past and your past relationships and making sure that you don't carry those mistakes forward with you and you make the right career choices to lead you to success, which is ultimately your own happiness and mindfulness.
What advice would you give to a future leader? 